Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everyone. Um, it really is a pleasure to be able to join you today. I, um, I'm very grateful to see this part of the world um, and also to share in the, the knowledge exchange that's, that's happening at this meeting. Um, so I'd like to thank Crystal and, and Rick for the invitation. And um, I'm looking forward to, to meeting you in person um, as the day goes on. So I've got um, this topic, which is probably one of the longest titles in the, uh, in the program. And it's a, very broad, it's a very broad topic. I mean, clearly water, energy, land and food are key for satisfying basic human needs and they're essential for sustainable development and for life. We need to understand better access and good management for these resources. And for that reason, they have been extensively studied, but often in isolation. The elements all have their own characteristics and are specialty areas. But they're also clearly linked, clearly and complexly linked. Um, water is an input for producing agricultural products on, farm, on farmland and along the entire agri-food and, and fibre supply chain. Energy is required to produce and distribute water and food, to pump water from groundwater um, and surface water sources, to power farm and irrigation machinery, and to process and, and transport agricultural goods. In fact, the food supply chain accounts for about 30% of total global energy consumption. Agriculture is currently the largest user of land and of water at the global at the global level accounting for about 70% of total water withdrawals and occupying almost 40% the total global ice-free land surface. They are important. How can we bring them together? It needs multidisciplinary approaches. We can, we can illustrate them simply and we can illustrate the externalities and how they fit into a bigger picture. The global pressures of population growth, climate change and changing demographics are critical. And there are policies and program responses that are needed to ensure that we have good outcomes for, for environment, for society and health and for the economy. So this morning, with this very broad topic, I'm only going to touch on the surface and I'm going to focus on some of the aspects of the role of animal agriculture and look at some of the challenges, the threats and the opportunities, and the opportunities are most important. And um, I'm going to do this firstly with a few facts, which are probably fairly dry, but I think it's important to, um, to understand the, the complexities. I've illustrated it very simply. There are many illustrations that you can download that show the global food system map. This is one of my favourites, and, and I'm not being critical of this. It is important to recognise all these aspects. But if you come down to it, it still involves land, water, energy and food. It still recognises the same pressures, and it still looks for outcomes. We'll go back to the simple approach, though, um, and just talk about some of the reasons why this nexus perspective is important. Firstly, just a few facts on water. The total usable freshwater supply for ecosystems and human is about, humans is about 200,000 cubic kilometres of water. That's less than 1% of all freshwater resources that we have available. Around 30% of the world's fresh water is stored underground in the form of groundwater. And that constitutes about 90%, 97% of all the fresh water that's potentially available for us to use. As I mentioned, agriculture is the biggest water use, with irrigation accounting for 70% of global water withdrawals. But only 20% of the world's cropland is irrigated. And whether cropland is irrigated or not can make a big impact 
on the productivity of that land, on the yields that are achieved. Without improved efficiencies, agricultural water consumption is expected to increase globally by about 20% by 2050. But importantly, greater efficiency of water use is achievable. And it's important because groundwater, as the primary source of drinking water worldwide, is, uh, the use of it is increasing by 1% to 2% per year. An estimated 35% of all withdrawals between 1998 and 2002 were from groundwater. And groundwater contributed 42% of all irrigation water, 36% of domestic use, and 27% of total manufacturing use. Part of the reason I mention those figures is that I was talking this morning, and um, in California, as in Australia, there is increasing access to deeper and deeper groundwater. But we know that um, there is clear evidence that groundwater supplies are diminishing with an estimated 20% of the world's aquifers being overexploited, exploited, some critically so. And the surface, the surface water scarcity is recognised as a problem. It varies globally, and we need to understand the reasons for that scarcity, whether they're physical or, um, I suppose, economic uh, drivers contributing to that scarcity. It affects almost, water scarcity already affects almost every continent and more than 40% of people on our planet. By 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity and two thirds of the world's population could be living under water stress conditions. And I haven't started to, uh, to talk about water quality and that's equally important as quantity. Looking at the linkages between water and energy, just briefly, energy is required for the provision of water so services and water resources are required in the production of energy. In 2010, 15% of the world's total water withdrawals were used for energy production and energy demand is expected to increase by more than one third in the period 2010 to 20, 2035. And particularly in the Asia Pacific region, from barely a third of global consumption to uh, over 50% by 2035. Thermal power plants are responsible for roughly 80% of global electricity production, and the world remains committed to coal-fired coal energy production. Power plant cooling is responsible for 43% of total fresh water withdrawals in Europe, nearly 50% in the USA, and more than 10% in China. If we look at different forms of energy production and the amount of water consumption and the amount of withdrawals for different forms of gas, you can see that there are no easy solutions to this problem. And in fact, quite recently, there have been statements to the effect that we, we're going to have to make a choice. We'll have to decide where we spend our water in the future. Do we want to spend it on keeping the power plants going or as drinking water? We don't have enough water to do both. It's a pretty damning statement. And this um, slide just illustrates the increase that we can expect by 2050 and where it's going to occur. So in developing countries, irrigation water is expected to increase. That has to be viewed in the context of the absolute water scarcity and the, um, the endowment that some countries have. Clearly, water, increasing water withdrawals in Vietnam is different to increasing water withdrawals in Chad. We need to understand that context but we need to look at it um, and understand what those connections are. This illustration of what is commonly called land grabbing emphasises that the rapid growth 
in large-scale land dealings around the world. Land grabbing is a source of alternative energy crops and environmental services. But in a significant number of these deals, water as well as food production is a driver. There are broad national implications and, and security implications for these la um, land deals. But the effect is often felt most acutely at the local level. The demand for agricultural feedstock for biofuels is one of the drivers of land deals. It's the largest source of new demand for agricultural production and arable land in decades and has been a major factor in world commodity prices. And behind all this, we have natural factors. Drought is the number one threat to food supply in high population countries and the number one threat in many cases for sustainable land management. So we have all these considerations, all these complexities and interactions to be considered as we move forward. And we look at how we can provide the food that's necessary for a growing population to overcome the nutrition security problems that are affecting about a billion people now who are undernourished with that number um, potentially increasing. We're going to need to produce something like 50 or 60 per cent more food within these constrained resources. So how does, what, what is the role of animal agriculture in this issue? Animal agriculture occupies a large, large area of land globally. Um, across all continents. Um, 30 per cent of global land area is used for livestock rearing. Meat production requires eight to ten times more water than cereal production. An area the size of a football pitch can produce 250 kilograms of beef, or 1,000 kilograms of poultry, or 15,000 kilograms of fruit and vegetables. These are the sort of statements that um, are given to consumers, are given to our political leaders, and I would suggest they're misleading and, um, can be, and, and open to misinterpretation. Consumers are ethical people, they want to do the right thing, but we as researchers too need to put these statements in a context that portrays animal agriculture as a real part of the solution for managing water, land, food um, and energy resources. Because um, it's a major it's a major contribution to protein, and particularly in developing countries. And so a simple solution of um, decreasing animal, animal agriculture is not going to solve these problems. Animal agriculture, particularly in developing countries, has multiple roles. We can manage better. And I'm, I want to move on to, to just looking at some of the factors that play into how water, land, energy and food interact as part of managing animal agriculture. And I'm going to do that um, using an example from Australia. And this is part of a, a life cycle assessment study. And I think that there is a real scope for combining life cycle assessment approaches with a nexus perspective to better understand how these interactions work and how we can bring together a multidisciplinary approach. Because when it comes to response, the response particularly within the political area is often constrained by lack of data, lack of clear articulation of the linkages between these resources, the resource use and the solutions. And, um, I think sometimes a failure on our part to communicate better 
how um, these things come together and what the opportunities are. So I'm going to firstly um, provide the results very briefly from this study, but then demonstrate how the context is important for interpreting them and providing that information up the, up the chain to policy to, and working with farmers to make things happen on ground. So this study looked at a 30-year period from 1981 to 2010 to look at the changes in resource use and um, environmental impacts of the Australian beef industry. And I'll say from the outset, this was um, a very difficult project in that the data weren't available. But getting, getting the information to try to quantify these impacts is not easy. And um, I'll explain that, what I mean by that in a minute. So the amount of beef produced in Australia um, increased by about 50% over that period. And just in, in raw terms, there was a 65% reduction in consumptive water use per kilogram of live weight produced at the farm gate. Energy demand increased almost twofold over that period. And there was a decline in land use. Land use for grazing, so that's uh, mostly non-arable land. And um, about a sevenfold increase in the arable land occupation for feed production. What do those numbers mean in terms of what we can learn about better managing our resources? And I'll add that the climate change impact um, decreased as well. It decreased by about 40, 14% for the animal production side, so that's excluding land use change, and about, there was about a 42% decrease in the land use change contribution. And climate change is important, the impact of greenhouse gases needs to be quantified because that's the sort of information that is being presented um, to consumers. We can only understand what those numbers mean if we put them in the context of the industry. So I'll very quickly run through what the beef industry looks like in Australia, um, although many of you will probably be somewhat familiar with it. Um, Australian beef cattle production occurs over a large part of the country. These numbers are the um, number, uh, the, million, the million head per state. So Queensland has the most cattle, and, um, but they're scattered through arid zones and coastal areas. So there's differences in climate, differences in geography, and differences between the north and the south and the way these are managed. So in the south, we have um, European breeds of animals grazing fairly lush, temperate-type pastures. We have um, zebu breeds in the north because of their um, better drought tolerance and tick resistance. We have smaller drought-adapted animals in the centre. And we have um, large areas of grazed savanna woodlands of varying qualities. The Australian grazing industry, has the development has been fairly recent. It started only around, after European settled, in around 1825, and expanded from, um, make that work, from the first settlements around Sydney, um, basically inland and northwards, over the, the rest of the 19th century. So it's been a fairly recent and I suppose a fairly um, rapid occupation of land. The numbers um, have varied. This is more recent period from 1960 to quite recently. So cattle numbers have gradually gone up. A lot of the, rec the um, initial development of land for grazing was for sheep. Australia is said to have ridden on the sheep's back. That's what I learned when I was at primary school. But numbers have dropped with the fall in, um, in wool prices, um, although that has been to some extent arrested because of um, a transfer of interest in sheep from wool to meat. 
some extent. But um, the small map there shows the current um, occupation of land by beef. More recently, as well as extensive grazing and, um, and pure pasture-fed beef, there's been, there have been feedlots introduced. So about two million head of cattle went through feedlots um, with, some, with relatively short grain finishing, um, probably much shorter than you have in this country, often 80 to 120 days. Um, but that's been a, um, a more recent phenomenon within this 30-year period that we're analysing. And it's resulted in bigger animals and, and um, faster finishing. We also have live export, and that also impacts on where the animals are and, um, and how they're managed. The environmental pressures on our extensive grazing um, industries are quite, um, are quite strong in, and determine how they're managed and what the pressures on resources are. Distance is a big problem, hence the live export. Um, and the fact that the feedlots are often located close to centres of population where processing occurs, but also where there's grain availability. So they're essentially in the coastal areas. And the, this rainfall map shows that much of our production is in less than 300 millimetres of rainfall. We have tropical breeds in the north because of their drought and their um, better adaptation to heat and tick resistance, and uh, European breeds in the south. So that's a, a basic picture of, of the industry, except that I'd like to emphasise that climate variability is a major factor on year-to-year -year production. So from about the turn of this century, um, we had a fairly severe drought, a long-lasting drought, that was widespread in, in Australia, it went from about 2002 to 2009 in many areas. And that, um, that climate variability from drought to flooding rains, which we have here, um, where we had a couple of good La Nina years, is um, a major influence on animals numbers and on the pressures on farmers. It affects both um, rainfall but also pasture growth. So we can, we can map rainfall from year to year and how it varies and also pasture growth. This property um, that I downloaded this for last, yesterday is in north eastern Queensland which is an area of high rainfall variability. But our feed stocks for grain are also affected by rainfall variability. How, this manage, how the, the stock numbers are matched to feed availability during a, in a variable climate determine the condition of our land to some extent. And you can see here a fence line contrast between um, land that's been managed reasonably well and man, land that's been overgrazed. And that can have longer term implications for production. So over the 30 year period, how does that, oh sorry, just before I do that, I forgot I put this in to show um, that we have had longer term trends as well as interannual variability. These two maps here, I thought were important to show that if you look at the annual trend from 1970 to 2014, and you look at the decadal variation in temperature and in rainfall, Australia is overall getting hotter Apart from an area in the north here, it's hotter over much of the beef production areas and it's also drier. There are three hotspot areas where we've had major declines in, um, in rainfall over this extended period in eastern Australia, but particularly down the coast. In western Victoria, um, in, sorry, in southeastern Australia around Victoria, which is largely dairy country, and in the southwest corner, where um, sheep production is strong and, and grain growing. Farmers recognise those trends and um, are, are making adjustments 
they don't always say, yes, it's human-induced climate change, but the changes are occurring. Everything from dry sowing, no-till in the grains area, to selection of breeds and types of cattle in the grazing industry. And I'll just mention that at the moment we're still in the throes of another drought. See, after those wet periods that we saw from 2010 to 2011, this was the current rainfall, relative rainfall um, over a two-year period up to just before Christmas. And you can see the extent of the drought here. And that has had a major impact on our, um, our cattle industry and our sheep industry. There's been a lot of hardship, a lot of selling off of animals, um, and I think increasing debt is a real issue as a result of, of that. It has also long-term effects. You, know, you can see the, the effect it has on, on, um, uh, land, you know, on wind erosion. And I'd just say that that's not necessarily meaning that farmers haven't haven't managed well. It's in relation to the severity of the drought, but total grazing pressure. So farmers can take their stock off. If the kangaroos, kangaroo plague comes through, you still end up with bare ground and um, loss of topsoil. Okay, so just um, moving on and looking at these results that we got for, um, for the life cycle assessment study. So the results said 65% reduction in consumptive water use for beef production. And I'd, I'd say, you know, we, we're estimating repeatedly numbers like between 250 and 500 litres of water per kilogram of live weight at the farm gate. This is very different to the numbers that are often quoted by um, interest groups of 15,000 kilograms per litre of beef as a global average, or even 100,000 kilograms of, of water per, um, sorry, litres of water per kilogram um, that, that can be quoted. And this is a real, realistic number in non-irrigated um, pasture-fed beef. So why did that reduction occur? If you look at if you look at what's happened, whoops, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. How can I go back? Um, <clears throat> the big change has been in the irrigation of pasture and in drinking water supply losses. So, looking firstly at the drinking water supply losses, a major impact on that has been the capping of, of bores. Groundwater is a major um, water use. And this has been a cooperative effort between government and, and landowners in capping uncontrolled bores and in covering um, open drains, which for you know, almost 100 years were just allowed to evaporate off. There is still work to be done. The reason I added that there's still 215 bores and almost 5,500 kilometres of bore drain requiring action is that the government, our government, is considering withdrawing financial support for doing this work, and that's a political statement. Um, the other, the other influence um, has was on um, irrigation water. Part of the, the downturn in use of irrigation for pasture has just been economics. The cost of water has gone up. And if you look at the role of governance in that, um, our, our water rights were traditionally bundled with land titles so that if you had land, you had water rights. And that was the case for about, 100, uh, about over 100 years. In 2000, and seven, during that prolonged drought that I mentioned and the um, threat to the, the Murray-Darling Basin, which is our major water, river and aquifer source, um, the government introduced a separation of water and land titles. We could trade water, but the cost went up. And it just became not non-feasible to pay for that water to irrigate pastures. There are further um, changes that the government has been talking about now um, to transfer permanent trade in water entitlements 
and temporary trade to sort of more refine that. But that role of governance is important. But the actions on ground still came from farmers. So that's understanding the context for the two-thirds reduction in water supply. Land occupation. A decline of 19% land occupation for grazing per unit of production over a three-year decade period. Let's look at that part. There has generally been a trend in the amount of um, land allocated to grazing in Australia. Um, and part, mostly that has been transfer of non-arable land um, largely into conservation areas and to some extent forestry. There's been a slight increase in, in arable land occupation for crops rather than grazing. Um, but farmers have become more efficient. They're producing more per hectare. If you look at the other part of that statement, a sevenfold increase in land occupation for feed production, I mentioned that um, feedlotting and grain finishing has been a fairly recent um, adoption in, in Australia. It hasn't traditionally been part of our production, and you can see that here. If you look at the total number of young cattle finished on grain, um, the red area there has increased dramatically, and that's why there's been an increase, a sevenfold increase in, in land used for, uh, in arable land used for beef, but it was from a very low base. Fossil energy demand, a twofold increase. It, it's clear that, again, that increase is occurring here in the food, feedlot ration production. There's been increases across the board. But um, that, again, is related to feedlots. So this is a sort of trade-off, if you like, that has come from more efficient production and also a capacity to, um, to ride over some of those drought impacts with, with grain feeding. Just um, briefly on the climate change impacts. Um, a decrease in greenhouse gas intensity of 14%. And this has come largely through using better breeds, um, larger and larger carcass weight at slaughter, and um, um, also faster finishing on grain. The decrease in land use change emissions of 42% has come because of, largely through Queensland. If you remember Queensland on the northeastern side, um, land development has been more recent. There, was, there has been, up until 2006, quite a lot of clearing of woodlands for um, pasture development to manage that balance between woody vegetation and, and grass, native grasses. Um, and in 2006, there was a ban introduced through legislation on broad-scale land clearing. So that um, decrease in land use change, greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of, of beef has been a real change um, and is being managed. I might add that it may increase slightly because of a government relaxation in Queensland of those rules. So if we look across how we integrate those and how we understand them, there have been improvements in efficiencies and some understanding of the trade-offs through farmer knowledge and actions, research and governance, They've all contributed and we need to understand that complex interaction to bring a nexus perspective into how we look to manage in the future. But we must understand the location, situation, circumstances to manage those outcomes. And that applies not only to change over time, it applies to differences between countries. These are some results from another study, this time for on sheep. Um, between three countries, the UK, New Zealand, and two systems in Australia, um, a very extensive system and a more intense system. And you can see that um, there are differences between countries. You have to understand why those sheep are being produced in, in the UK and New Zealand. The focus is on um, meat production more than wool production. And um, they, they can be heavier animals. Um, if you look particularly at that non arable land occupation, simply saying that one system takes 9,000 
hectares of land to produce um, for, for this system. Now, I should have said that this, these results are all scaled to a standardised flock size of 1,000 ewes, so it's just to provide a comparative way of looking at it. So that relative difference looks enormous, but the type of land is um, non-arable, semi-arid land, which really is not suitable for other forms of production. Other differences um, need context too. The higher energy use in the UK is due to the fact that some housing is required over winter, um, which obviously we don't use in, in Australia. So I just want to stress that we have to understand the drivers and the circumstances to be able to understand how to manage these resources to optimise their use for production in different areas. Crystal, how am I going for time? Sorry. <laughs> so, five minutes, okay. So I'll very quickly move through a couple of research areas um, that are contributing to how we might look at this in the future. This figure here is uh, from a colleague, um, Luciano Gonzalez. And what it does is plot, the, the dots here are actual weighings of animals. In Australia, many of our animals are only seen once a year at annual muster. But in this study, though, our animals were weighed regularly. So, and this is the, the hard line is the uh, model. This dotted line is the actual daily live weight change. These vertical lines are where interventions occurred, for instance, shifting paddocks. So if you move paddocks, in, you, know, you get an increase in the daily live weight gain, daily intake, and then it falls off again. And if we just look at that shape, what happens here, this is the start of the wet season. Animals often lose about two months' worth of growth in that period. How can we use this information better? And this is just um, a, a herd type graph for the same reason. We did this to look at methane emissions, but if you focus on the blue line, it's the same thing. And if you look at where the animals were in, in February compared to, to a year before and just draw a straight line, that's the, the live weight gain. But in reality, there's been no um, beef production, but the animal's been using land, water, energy, and emitting greenhouse gases in that period there for those last couple of months. So we can learn from that, if we understand what's happening, that perhaps, and at least some herds, it makes more sense to slaughter them or to move them to better feed months earlier and save that resource use and also look at the greenhouse gas savings that you can get. They're emitting methane um, for, for really no gain for the farmer. Or you could consider um, supplementing them at that stage to avoid that period with no, no advantage. And the economic gains and the efficiency gains are important. We can use remote technologies to optimise how we use, introduce more waters, how we look at the grazing patterns to optimise the use of that land. Um, I'm not going to try to explain that figure, but it's just important to know that there are now technologies that can help us to optimise resource use. And while I've, I've focused on, um, on beef production, there are similarly advantages for intensive livestock industries. Um, we have a, a government introduced program from our last government called the Carbon, Carbon Farming Initiative that provides some incentive for introducing um, greenhouse gas reduction offsets projects within agriculture. It resulted in the introduction of, in several piggeries, and I was um, told yesterday that piggeries is an Australian term. I think it has something to do with swine here. Um, um, of introducing methane capture. And just to take two farm advantage, uh, farm, farm examples. Um, this top one 
Um, they introduced commercial methane digestion system. Um, the farm power bill and the gas bill reduced from $15,000 a month to a net income by selling back into the grid of $5,000 a month. The government um, program provided incentive. The economic benefits actually drove the introduction and um, will then continue to do so. Um, I'm short of time, so I won't go through the next example, but it, there are many examples that you, can, that you can use from intensive animal agriculture. So how can animal agriculture take advantage of the opportunities, the opportunities for the increase in, in meat um, consumption that's projected to occur, and manage the expectations, uh, the, sorry, the, um, uh, the pressures that will come from that needing need for feed for those animals. We need to bring together, to understand the pressures and to bring together farmer policy and researcher information to make that happen. So managing those externalities, climate change, population, demographics, for farmers, the pressures can become crises, but preparedness and efficiencies increase resilience. For policymakers, well, they need to understand the data limitations that constrain policy, but also understand the trade-offs, which are often most acute at the local level. They have resource and trade um, prominence at national scale, and they have climate change and security implications at global levels. For researchers, we have to work out what knowledge and what data are needed, but then how to bring them together and communicate them. And integration um, of all those aspects are important. Farmers are getting on with it. They're quietly making changes. This is a farmer that I know um, in Queensland. He's looking at what he does. He's, he's examining his land better, adjusting to different aspects of the land, and adjusting his, sea, his cattle numbers to suit rainfall, using taking advantage of more accurate um, seasonal forecasts. And he says, our plans for the future include building more water points and reducing paddock size. He's also choosing smaller animals that are more heat resistant. Farmers are doing this. We need to work with them. And finally, um, what's the role of governance? Nexus planning and policy development should be appropriate to res the resource situation. Different countries are endowed with different natural, biophysical and climate wealth. That has to be considered in planning how to respond. The developmental status also determines the, the prospects for economic strength and uh, population growth, but the capacity to respond. And the future pre preferences pressures and resilience will guide that, um, those opportunities. Incorporating animal agriculture and nexus policies is sensitive to food requirements. It is a major source of protein. It is required into the future. Trends in emerging pressures of climate change and externalities, such as competitive pressures for land and water, have to be considered and would have to be considered realistically in view of the type of land that's used and, and the alternative uses. Resilient requirements in the context of local societal values. You have to take into account the, the community that you're working in. And we can't ignore consumer expectations for health provenance, sustainability and ethics. So with an apology for a rather rushed finish, thank you. Uh, we do have time for a, a question or two. Anyone has a question? We can uh, bring you a microphone. So you had a slide where you showed, it was back a few, where you had, uh, you had 
like two months of no net weight gain. I was, was that in a grass fed scenario? I guess that would be my first question. Okay, um, so th this is a northern production system that has two seasons, wet season and dry season. So the feed um, builds up during the, the good season. During the winter, um, the, the feed on the ground dries off and loses quality. So it's difficult for animals to consume more than their maintenance requirement. So about 40% of their feed intake uh, generally goes on maintenance. So they, they're not being able to take in enough um, nutrition to, get, to do more than maintain their weight. What happens when the season breaks and you get the first rainfall is that basically the, the, the feed on the ground, which is by that time is dry grass, turns to something mushy and unpalatable for animals and they often have a period of weight loss at that time. So it's a function of the, the seasonal conditions and um, you know, supplementation is often used but um, uh, it's the only way to overcome that, that uh, variation in weight gain. Okay, I guess the part I didn't understand is so they're not, when they're peaking at their weight gain, they're not, they're not taking those cattle to slaughter. They're just leaving them out there. And I'm sorry, could you repeat that? When looking at the curve, it looked like they, they hit a peak weight. And I guess my question is, is isn't there enough economics there to drive them to send those cattle to slaughter or to move them on? I mean, in a feedlot scenario, you would, that's where you'd stop and you'd sell them. Otherwise, obviously, the margins aren't good enough to keep feeding something for two months. Yeah, so th there's both costs and, and um, space constraints on sending all those animals to, to a feedlot. Um, what's used more commonly is uh, things like molasses or salt licks to increase um, feed intake, but um, the, the practicalities of, of getting the animals to a feedlot, finding the capacity there and paying for that constrains how many animals actually are, are grain finished. There's also um, a real goal towards fully pasture fed um, animals increasingly in Australia as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just give it a hand, please. I know that the others likely had questions. Uh, you can catch Dr. Henry during the break. That would be great.